Artifacts was the time in space lab when it still existed in the US and then was shut down by, I guess, the feds. I know people who work. I don't, I don't know that particular lab name. I know people who've worked with, you know, very high voltage experiments and space-time bubbles, as it were, dealing with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that is not a myth. And that is, you can do that. Uh, and that begins to bring up the question of phasing in this science. The, the, the attitude now is, let's not open Pandora's box, keep it all secret, meanwhile the Earth is dying. And I think that it does present, however, a conundrum, which I, it, I had a conversation with a colonel who was in charge of, the euphemism is, future technologies for the Air Force, which means they have it already. And I was at a private meeting here in the D.C. area, and he pulled me aside, he said, you know, these technologies can be weaponized. I said, oh yes, I know, and they already have been by elements that are out of control and aren't under the control of the President and the Congress. And he says, yes, but so we can't let this be known. And I said, Here is the, here's the, the, the big conundrum of our time. If these technologies come out and they're used for malevolent weapons purposes, very dangerous. If they don't come out and our only solution ends up being things that are fracking and gas and just pumping more stuff out of the earth and burning up the atmosphere, that's an existential problem. So every, we're in an existential crisis where the only path forward is to have people who are wise and the public being educated where these technologies are brought out and are strictly limited to non-weapons applications and that is enforced absolutely strictly. Um, how do you do that? Well, you can't do it by causing the international community to have no uh, say-so. Uh, at the same time, there's always going to be some sociopathic leader of some country, some madman, who will want to do something. And that's what the intelligence community worries about. So that is not a trivial concern. And I do not dismiss it because I am not a trivial person, frankly. However, the secrecy is killing us. So, and the disclosure of all this, not only information and the contact component of it, but also that we're not alone in the cosmos, which is an enormous disclosure, but the technological let's say, basket. There's a basket with all kinds of different technologies that are classified. At least the generation 1.0 ones that we get us off fossil fuels should come out. Then let's have a discussion. And I made this agreement with people in the intelligence community that I would not work on the ones that disrupt space time, that are weaponized, or that would result in lift. Now, a lot of people don't like that when they hear that because they want to have something like the George Jetson. I want my car to float and go. I said, someday. But the anti-gravity, as it's called in pop culture, but the electromagnetogravitic component of this, which is a very high voltage system that causes the lift effect because that whole spacecraft has a charge around it, creates kind of a space-time bubble, and becomes essentially massless, uh, or close to massless, so very light. Although when it sets down, it's very heavy. When, it's full, when that system is shut off, it'll bend a railroad tie. It's so heavy. It weighs tons. But when it's it, it's just like, it looks like it's floating, um, which it, essentially it is. Uh, that technology has obvious, shall we say, missile and Air Force applications. And that's why I've said at this point, I'm happy to leave that alone. So even when that's been offered to me, and it has been, in fact, I recently received a bunch of uh, blueprints from a grandchild of a man who worked on the early anti-grav devices. Uh, I have it in my vault. We have it. Um, but that's for a later phase. Uh, now, we're running out of time to come out with a Generation 1.0 energy system, which, which uh, can be done and configured so it's a stationary object that's not doing anything that's too magical, but just is creating, quote, free energy from the zero-point field 
that pulls this civilization off the death spiral it's in with the current geopolitical and geophysical crisis with fossil fuels. But that's, but let's at least do that. I always tell people, let's crawl before we walk and walk before we run and run before we levitate. <laughs> All right? But we're, we're on our backs right now. Our civilization's on its back, we're not even rolling around like a, a, a three month old. We need to get up and at least start moving in this correct direction. And that's why I, I, I feel it's very important for us to be honest. I try to be as honest as I can with people about the implications of some of the far end of this technology um, being something that uh, is worrisome if it were in the wrong hands. Uh, and that brings up the bigger question of isn't the crisis really a social, spiritual, cultural crisis in consciousness? The consciousness of wanting to take whatever we invent and weaponize it to get, gain dominion over someone else or some other culture. That is, the, that is, at the root, the fundamental problem. And that is a spiritual problem and a psychological and cultural, sociological problem that we have to address at the same time. But we're running out of time to do it sequentially. Because here's, here's, here's the conundrum. How do you create a peaceful world where everyone's singing Kumbaya when half the world's population is in dire poverty and there are 30 some people who have more than half of the net worth of the world in their control. This is not something that is a sustainable system. But you, you, so at some point we have to break out of that. Uh, I look at it as sort of this cul-de-sac that we've been in for 100 years. Sort of a, a blind, dead end street we've been running around in circles. Um, and the technology, I know that I work with a lot of people who you know been in Silicon Valley and various what we call high tech sector. I just go, not high tech. This is high tech. There's nothing high tech about a smartphone or a computer at all. Uh, and by the way, they're plugged into a coal fired power grid <laughs> from the 1800s. So a little perspective here is necessary, and that is uh, part of the problem is that we're trying to catch up on a hundred, I call it the lost century. Great title for a book and a video, by the way, but the lost century. There's a lost century of not just technological development, but sociological, economic, cultural development because of the suppression of this area of science and, and information. And because of that, we've kind of run out how much time we have before, it's like a rubber band that you can, the time, time is like a rubber band, you can stretch it out or it can contract, but we pull this rubber band about as far as it can until it snaps. And the snap can be a geopolitical crisis, war, or it can be a geophysical crisis where we have both polar ice caps melting, or what have you. But ultimately we're at that point, and I'm not trying to sound at all apocalyptic, but I'm just saying that uh, as, as the Chinese saying goes, unless we change directions, we're likely to end up where we're going. So where, we, where the trend lines are, are very disturbing. And um, everyone kind of is diverted into um, the internet and they all think that that's, oh, we're doing such great technology, but th there's nothing. Your car is a 1800s internal combustion engine, literally from the 1800s, trains, mid-1800s. A nuclear power plant is a steam engine. Basically, you're getting heat from splitting the atom. You're boiling water, creating steam that turns a turbine, a la the 1800s. You just have all this nuclear waste. That lot, most people don't know. It's not, you're not getting energy directly from the atom. It's just heat to boil water. That's why I have these huge tooling, cooling towers. Um, and if you think that's not a problem, go visit Fukushima. And then you have jets. Well, jets are, were invented in the 1930s. So those of you who flew here on a jet, you were flying on a, a souped up version of a 1930s jet engine. And rockets, Werner von Braun, 1940s for the V2 rocket. Every technological breakthrough in energy and propulsion since the 40s has been classified. So now we're running on 70 years of this secrecy, which is, as Eisenhower predicted, run amok. But in the classified world, as you rightly point out, there are programs that have gone apace 
I mean, they're on generation 500 of stuff that most people can't even believe would exist. They're, they're, they would, they're, their eyes would roll back. Even the physicists at MIT, their eyes would fold, roll back. So we at least need to catch up with, say, 1920. I mean, so people think what I'm proposing is very bold. I said, I'm really very moderate about saying where we're trying to catch up to, but most people don't know the history, this lost century, uh, that at the cost of secrecy and, and an out of control national security state um, that has gotten hybridized and placed mainly in the corporate world. All the big action is corporate. All right, you know, SAIC, Booz Allen Hamilton, Lockheed, my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman. He was with Grumman when they developed the, the lunar module, um, et cetera, and so on. And so, MITRE Corporation, uh, BA Systems, these are all. So, if you you know you get you know the hundred to two hundred billion dollars missing out of the out of the U.S. Treasury every year, going into these corporate entities through a front door program that's really a shell. It's like the mafia using a a restaurant to launder their money, and then it goes into a backdoor black project, unacknowledged special access project, which is the proper term. And that's, that, you know, when Eisenhower said, but we're the military industrial complex, it was a little bit of money. Rumsfeld, as you've seen in the film Sirius, back in the day before 9-11, said it's $2.3 trillion unaccounted for. Trillion. Now, since 9-11, the, the amount of spending in that sector has gone way up. So it's an enormous amount of funding and resources that are, are going into projects. Uh, now, the president and members of Congress, or Senator Feinstein, has to pretend like they know everything that these corporations and entities are doing, because after all, the emperor doesn't want to admit he has no clothes. No, and this was one of the things that was pointed out to me in meeting with the CIA director and other people, is that no president wants to admit that there's this big permanent infrastructure running apace, siphoning off hundreds of billions, $2.3 trillion in funding that neither the president nor the oversight committees of the Congress over here have any knowledge of. No one wants to admit that. Well, but why? Because they would, it would create this constitutional crisis like we've never seen. And we're seeing a little bit of that with Senator Feinstein uh, kind of mud wrestling with the CIA over the torture stuff. But this would be that a thousand times more difficult and complex. So I've had members of the Senate who I have, and members of the Senate Intelligence Committee I've, I've met with in the past who've gone, uh, we've suspected these things are going on, but we are never briefed on them. Mm -hmm.